Hello, Fresh Ed listeners. Before the start of this episode, I want to encourage any graduate students listening to consider applying for a Flux Fellowship for our third season. My name is Brett Lashua, and I'm one of the series producers. Flux is a Fresh Ed series where master's and PhD students transform their research interests into narrative-style podcasts. We've just finished our second year of Flux Fellowships, and it's been a huge success. The application window is now open for the third year of Flux, and we're looking for creative, driven, and collaborative graduate students who want to turn their research interests into an audioscape. If that's you, please head over to freshedpodcast.com forward slash flux to find out more about the application details. The deadline for submissions is February 17th, 2023. Okay, now back to Will and on with the show. Hi, Fresh Ed listeners. It's Will here. The Fresh Ed team is taking a few weeks off after a busy year. While we're away, we'll be replaying some of our favorite episodes. Before we start today's episode, I wanted to take a minute to ask for your help. You're listening to us right now for free. In fact, all of our content is open access and freely available. However, it's not free to create, produce, and publish Fresh Ed. We are funded by the generous donations from listeners like you. If you wanted to support independent media, or maybe you've used Fresh Ed in your classes, or you simply love our show, then please consider making a donation. You can do so at freshedpodcast.com slash donate. Again, that's freshedpodcast.com slash donate. Thanks for your support, and we'll be back with new episodes soon. This is Fresh Ed, a weekly podcast that makes complex ideas in educational research easily understood. I'm your host, Will Brem. In our fast-changing world, how should we think about curriculum? For what should education aim? And has the COVID-19 pandemic revealed any failures in our education systems worldwide? These are admittedly difficult questions to answer and dependent on context. But to help make sense of some of these questions, UNESCO's International Bureau of Education has recently published a set of normative documents to help guide the future of curriculum in the 21st century. Being able to balance your rights with other people's rights, to balance privileges with responsibilities, to respect freedoms. Today, Dr. Mansetsa Marope, the director of the International Bureau of Education at UNESCO, joins me to talk about a competence-based curriculum that can support the attainment of the Education 2030 agenda. Dr. Marope has extensive experience in education, including 11 years as a university professor, 10 years at the World Bank, and 11 years at the United Nations. Mansetsa Marope, welcome to Fresh Ed. Thanks, Dr. Brad. Uh, Thanks for having me. So I want to talk today a little bit about curriculum and development, and you've been involved in different aspects of education for for quite some time and at many different levels. So how would you conceptualize the very idea of development? Before we get to the the core of that question, let me just say, you know, the term development can be used in general, colloquial, conversational terms. It just means change. For instance, if journalists were monitoring a situation unfolding, they could ask one another, has there been any development? Meaning, has the situation changed? And the change could be for the better or for the worse. So development in and of itself is just a neutral term meaning change. In the U.S., for instance, development can be also used to mean a change in a, in a, a local context. Like, for instance, if you have a, a mall coming up or a new neighborhood, they often it's not uncommon for them to refer to it as a development and the people involved as developers. If uh, authors were discussing a story, they could talk about the development of the story, just meaning how it unfolds. So in the just general conversation, but then more towards the technical end, um, development is used to refer to very specific aspects of life, like economic development, a child's uh, development, stages of development. We have, for instance, very established instruments 
like the World Development Report, the Human Development Report, etc. So when you get technical with that, the, that word, you'd see that many things developed. It could be a child, it could be a city, it can be a person, it could be the world, it can be a human being, and so on and so forth. So I um, just want to say uh, that our chat, if I may just call it a chat, which is indeed what it is, is about development in technical terms. And I prefer to, I conceptualize development as uh, the constant and sustainable advancement or growth of an entity, an individual, a collective, a nation, or the world that translates into a better or more desirable state of being and a better enjoyment of a better quality of life and ultimately fulfillment. So in this technical perspective, development necessarily takes a positive tone in the sense that it culminates in a better state of being, in a higher enjoyment of life, in a better quality of life and in fulfillment. So organizations like UNESCO or the World Bank working in international development and specifically in our field, international development and education, the idea is that it's a these organizations and institutions are are working in a sort of technical way to at least in your conceptualization to have constant growth towards some desirable outcome or life uh, as as it's so desired exactly i mean for unesco for instance the ultimate goal of unesco is to promote peace and collaboration among nations uh, for the World Bank, I would hazard a guess and say that the World Bank works towards a better economic, shared economic prosperity and, and quality of life. And depending on different presidents, when I was still at the bank, the bank was really focused heavily on the elimination of, of poverty and inequality across life. So it, they all work towards a better state of being and the upliftment of, of people. And even I can go on is that such development from this uh, technical perspective, to me, development has multiple enablers. For instance, economic growth. Economic growth enables us to afford a better state of being, but that growth has to be shared growth. And that's why there's a reference of shared growth of growth with equity. A second important enabler is social uh, cohesion and stability. You can't have development in a state of perpetual social fracture and instability. But that social cohesion necessarily has to be underpinned by respect and value for diversity. An appreciation and almost a celebration of diversity that perceives diversity as an asset and not a complexity that has to be tolerated or coped with. So this is a very important enabler. The third enabler is political stability, but that political stability, which is underpinned by political pluralism. So as just as social diversity, that political plurality perceived as an enrichment of the political dialogue that leads to higher levels of checks and balances of power, higher levels of democracy, and higher level of um, recognition of every political perspective as a worthy perspective that brings value to the table and that improves the governance of, of a, a particular country or society. Also important, respect for human rights, human freedoms, justice for all. And we have other elements of, of enablers like technological advancement. Today, particularly, 
it's it's difficult to imagine us talking about development without including in it technological advancement. But to all these elements that whether it's social stability, shared gro economic growth, political stability, technological advancement, human rights, you know, health services and stuff, is is education is extremely important that education is one of the enablers of development equal opportunity to high quality and relevant education for all is important not just as a right in itself but because education enables other enablers for instance we need educated people with appropriate competencies to boost productivity which is the basis for growth. We need people who are socially astute and educated, who understand human values, who understand issues around diversities and what, so who can work towards social stability, social cohesion. All these enablers are driven by people, but not just human beings, but well-prepared, competent human resources. So education becomes a very core enabler in its own right, an enabler of development, but also an enabler of other enablers. And that's why it is extremely rare to find any document that talks about development that does not underscore the importance of education. And so one of the big features of education that we can think about when we are trying to figure out ways in which education can actually be that enabler of both development and other enablers, is the curriculum. So in, in your work and in your conceptualization, how, how do we connect development and the curriculum? If I can go back to the, to the, the point I was making that it's very rare to find any document that talks about development without mentioning education. There is just a taken for granted understanding that education is very pivotal to development. But what we actually mean is that education produces people with competences that we need to drive that development, whether that competence is multiculturalism and cultural understanding, whether that competence is a technology savvy that allows somebody to work in a particular environment, whether that competence is a green skill and so on. The curriculum, on the other hand, is the concrete operational tool in an education system that societies use to collectively decide what is important for people to know and to know how to apply it. So the curriculum is that tool through which societies define competences that they need in order to build a threshold of human resources required to drive development. Otherwise, we just have inspirational statements about the importance of education in development, but we need to go below the asp uh, aspirational and inspirational statements to say how and the curriculum is the how, because that's, as I said, where we very carefully define those competences that people must develop if they are to drive development. So one of the conundrums then is, you know, in if we take the word development to mean change, there's obviously a lot of change and development over time in any society and probably at any time and perhaps our current time the 21st century things are changing you know we might be able to quantify that things are changing a bit more rapidly than before but it doesn't really matter i mean there's massive social change over time and so then that question becomes you know are competencies constantly changing that need to be within and found within the curriculum or are there some competencies that are, say, stable or universal across time? Yeah, it is a conundrum indeed, because um, by, by saying that the curriculum is that concrete instrument for defining relevant competences, 
it's equal to saying whatever we say an education system is relevant or irrelevant. What we really mean is that it graduates people without competences that society expected from them. But as you said, that development context of that very society changes very fast. So the challenge is how do we sustain development relevance of education through the curriculum in fast changing context? And your question as to whether they are more uh, stable in the foreseeable future, as, 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 as much as we can say, competences. And, and my answer would be yes. We have to, when we talk about relevance, we have to see relevance, or at least I see relevance, as two sides of a coin. The one side is responsiveness, that this, this education system and this through its curriculum, it responds to contextual changes. And as you say, this can be very rapid, disruptive, unpredictable changes. But the other side of the coin is proactiveness, where we say, but what is the core business of education? What should education produce? Supposing we could hold the context still, but we still have education systems running, what exactly would those education systems be doing? And this is important to look at education's own core business as the steady thread that holds the curriculum stable for some foreseeable future and the responsive side as that boiling pot where, you know, COVID-19 outbreak, we very quickly go into the curriculum of both the formal and informal curriculum and quickly say, what should people learn in order to protect themselves from COVID-19? Now, the stable competences in a view, a couple of years ago, three years, time flies, we had a very long consultative process of trying to distill what could these core competences be, and we named them the macro competences, and we see them as, as, as stable competences. And the first one is knowing how to learn, and because in a rapidly changing context, what you learn, the what, can become obsolete very quickly. But if you know how to learn, when the context throws new challenges and new opportunities to you, you will learn anew. So this is the first competence that we think is stable. I don't believe there will be ever, there'll ever come a time when we can debate and say, ah, no, we don't need to know how to learn anymore. And because knowing how to learn is really the most robust source of human adaptability, agility to adapt and resilience. But it's not just for humans, it's also for entities. If the business doesn't learn, if a society doesn't learn, a political party doesn't learn, anything doesn't learn, it'll become obsolete. So that's the first stable competence. The second one is self-agency. And we see self-agency as teaching people to perceive themselves as self-benefiting agents, that they are responsible for their individual good and that they have to take responsibility and be self-benefiting. And they can act on their own behalf for their own good. And they don't have to wait for things to happen to them or for something else or someone else to do it for them. This is named in different ways at the micro level of competences like drive, motivation, endurance, grit, um, responsibility, and so on and so forth. The third one is interactively using diverse resources. At any point in time when you are seeking to act on your own behalf, you have multiple resources at your disposal. Time is a resource, technology, people around you, the expertise, wisdom around you, and so on. And are you able to harness these multiple resources around you to have a positive impact on your own life and to use these resources efficiently. And efficient use of resource is important because it's part of the building blocks 
of sustainable lifestyles and responsible consumption to know that, yes, I may have resources around me, but I have to use them efficiently and responsibly. And this is extremely important for any global citizen to recognize this. The fourth competence, I believe, is interacting with others. Yes, you are a self-benefiting agent, but no one person is sufficiently intelligent, wise, experienced to be able to depend solely on themselves. And at any one point when there is an opportunity in life or your context presents a challenge to you, you may use your own resources, but you often have to reach to others to work with them. When you start reaching out to others, you become a self-benefiting agent because you have a self-interest in there, but you also become a benefactor because you now start acting on behalf of other people's interests. And the same applies to them. They act in your interest and in their interest. This interacting with others for a positive impact also comes in many languages, teamwork, collaboration, negotiations, partnerships, and so on. Uh, But this is a very enduring competence. Do people know how to interact with each other? And I'm sure we'll come back to this uh, competence later. And the fifth competence is interacting in and with the world. Interacting with the world is a a bilateral transaction. You know, I need Dr. Bram, he needs me, and I can work across the world with you. But interacting in the world means I'm taking some space in your world, you are taking some space in my world and owning it so you become a world player. We talk so much of world thought leaders, world players, uh, people at the center stage of the world. These are people who are interacting in and with the world. They are not just interacting from their standpoint with the world, but they are integral inside the world. And it's also the bare basics of being local and global, that you are able to balance the ability to act at different levels of the world that you you live in and this this is quite important in our in our world as we as we know it now it means also being able to balance your rights with other people's rights to balance privileges with responsibilities to respect freedoms but balancing freedoms with rights because you are interacting with the world and in the world you are not just a self-benefiting agent or a small team interacting with others your sphere of influence is much bigger and therefore you have to have several considerations as you interact the sixth one is multidisciplinarity and uh, transdisciplinarity because a lot of times when you talk about competences, people quickly think, or it means the old disciplines are out of fashion. And we're now thinking about competences don't don't develop in a vacuum. Competence is actually being able to harness knowledge, skills, values, dispositions, uh, tech savvy and others to use them interactively to bring to bear a desired result. So a competence-based approach to education demands very deep understanding of disciplines because it goes beyond just knowing uh, the content and regurgitating it, but how to apply those disciplines transdisciplinarily in order to bear results. And that's because life challenges and opportunities don't come in smart packages of disciplines. You don't get a physics problem, a math problem, except in a classroom, of course. You get a problem that demands your your knowledge of multiple disciplines at any point in time. So while all of us have to be deep specialists in our areas, we also have to have a fairly decent threshold of mastery of other disciplines, enough to know when you are out of depth. And I know now I need to reach out and now go back to interacting with others because now I need Dr. Bram here 
you know, it, it's not my forte, but I need that augmentation. And the, the last uh, uh, competence is multiliteratedness. You know, when we grew up, maybe the three R's uh, cut it, but they don't cut it anymore. We've added digital literacy, financial literacy, health literacy, cultural literacy. It, the list goes on. But at any point in time, when you are in a context, some form of literacy is called on more than the other. So if I were in a multicultural context, I would be using different literacy more heavily than if I were in my little village in a small near uniform context, if there could be ever something like that. Now, if you look at these seven macro competencies, we believe they really do endure and they can be the bigger why of education. We need to produce people who know how to learn. We need to produce people who are self-benefiting agents, who can work in teams, who can use resources responsibly, who can, who are multiliterate, who are transdisciplinarians, and so on and so forth. But then around these macro competencies, we then have the ability to um, respond to contextual challenges as they rise. So at the end, a good curriculum design has to balance stability with agility because if all we are doing is responding all the time and you see this a lot in countries what we might get into is a curricula where we are always reforming reforms and before the previous reform could take root and it takes time for teachers particularly and learners and parents to settle into a new reform, to own it, to support and implement it. And before they can catch a hold of it, there's another reform and another and another. So that balance, that delicate balance needs to be struck. Do you think that balance was reached during this pandemic, the, the most recent pandemic of COVID-19? Like, has, the, has this global pandemic revealed any particular strengths or weaknesses in these sort of seven macro competencies? I think the one weakness that it revealed, a very stark weakness, is our feeble effort as the global education community at producing lifelong learners, at producing learners who know how to learn. Suddenly schools were closed there were no more teachers in front of learners, at least physically. And we then went into this slogan, interrupted classes, uninterrupted learning. But could we really swear and say that we knew that learning was not interrupted? I don't believe so. And if you look at what is the proportion of the world's children that we can safely say they have the competence of knowing how to learn, it's clearly very small because the evidence we have now uh, before COVID-19, we already had the global learning crisis where close to two thirds of the 617 million learners in general education, two thirds of them do not acquire basic reading, basic numeracy efficiency. If you can't read with understanding, the rest is just talk. You can't tell me that a child who already had difficulties understanding what the text they read can go home and sit in front of a computer. Some of them, no computer, listen to a, a radio with a very bad frequency, that they are effectively learning because they know how to learn. So I think if there is an urgent competence that really came out as needing serious intensive care is not just focusing on what people must learn, but on how, how they must learn and in their own understanding of how they learn. I think that's a, a stuck weakness. This, the second weakness, which applies more generally to education in general than just to curriculum, is the inequality of resources I said one of the competences is knowing how to use 
multiple resources interactively to bear desired results. But you can't know how to use resources if you don't have them. And then suddenly we had all these regions of the world where we assumed we can have distance learning, uninterrupted distance, distance learning, but then these kids don't have the basic things, just like those very radios we are talking about don't even go to connectivity and technological devices that they needed. So the inequality in resource provision that should enable effective teaching and learning environment were shown very nakedly by COVID-19. And I don't quite know how, how quickly this situation can be remedied, but it certainly is an, is an issue. The third weakness is self-agency, because self-agency means also self-management, because learners have to go into self-directed learning and parents had to step in and do uh, facilitate homeschooling. Teachers who weren't necessarily ready to present their materials to learners as a distance, be it digitally or otherwise, were suddenly also flung into their areas of incompetence. So what this is again an area where can we expect uh, are we teaching learners to take charge for their own learning or are we teaching them that there will always be someone in the form of a teacher, a parent, a something to help you learn? And I think this is one of the another area that we really need to to work on that COVID-19 showed us off in. Hmm. It's a, it's it's really quite fascinating. I mean, some of these sort of different priorities that education systems have and some of the, I guess we could say, inequalities in the inputs to education that, as you said, the pandemic has really sort of laid bare and could potentially result in sort of an inequality in, in how these different macro competencies are distributed worldwide, depending on context. So it's, it's really quite a fascinating insight that the crisis has revealed. And like you said, I also don't know the, the, the way forward or the correct answer other than these different inequalities need to be explored in much, much more depth. And I guess governments, citizens, school leaders have to be involved in a conversation as to how to how to rectify some of these inequalities. I'm not sure. What do you think? I think that um, we need we need an open dialogue. Now, the tricky part of this open dialogue is invariably those who are under resourced are also not able to join into the dialogue because the dialogue is conducted in a manner and language and culture that excludes them. Uh, for instance, if I can just quickly use Africa, for instance, a, a good amount of dialogue on education or development in general in Africa is, the, is conducted in foreign languages. So before we can even talk, get to, do we understand the concepts and do we mean the same things? It's just, can I hear what you are saying? So who, who, who's talking to parents and communities in their own native languages about the deep issues we are discussing now? You know, who, who's talking to parents about the importance of having electricity in their home if their kids have to always have some device that has to be charged. And even if you talk to them, who is enabling them to afford that electricity? Going back to economic growth as shared growth, if we are serious about development. So I think at least COVID-19 will force our hand at starting this dialogue. But the biggest challenge to me is how how broad based and broadly owned this dialogue can be because everybody can understand any concept if you deliver it in their language and if you demystify it and none of anything we've said is mysterious to anybody anybody you, you don't have to sit one minute with a parent to explain to them that their, the education of their child is important no parent at all 
But what they may not understand is what are all the facilitators and enablers they must have in order for their children to have an enabling learning environment. And even if they understood the second challenge, which is even more systemic, because this is now goes to global and national structural inequalities, even if they understood, do they have the means to afford those enablers? So the problem is by no means a quick turn. You know, and there's there's talk of the you know quick lending facilities, for instance, by the World Bank. There's talk of uh, donors putting more funding into education and so on. But I think the problem, the challenge is deeply systemic, and it it'll require maybe uh, much longer than we are willing to admit to unroot the structural inequalities that then translate into different home learning environments for different people and different children. Well, Mensetse Marope, thank you so much for joining Fresh Ed. Really a fascinating conversation on the future of curriculum. Thank you very, very much. Uh, And thanks for having me. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Dr. Mensetse Marope, is the director of the International Bureau of Education at UNESCO. A transcript of today's interview can be found at freshedpodcast.com. Please note that opinions expressed on Fresh Ed are solely those of the host or the guest interviewed, not Fresh Ed, which takes no institutional position. If you've liked what you've heard today, please consider rating us on iTunes. It really does help. Fresh Ed's producers are Sherry Yang, Hong Zong, and Lushik Waba. Fati Aktas is our researcher, and Ing Jung Cho is our content developer. Original music for Fresh Ed was created by Digital Primate. Thanks for listening. I'm Will Brem, and I'll be back next week.